Welcome to Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute, hosted by Georgina Downer. The Menzies era was a period of significant geopolitical challenges, marked by two key events, the dismantling of the European colonial system and, of course, the Cold War. This was a battle of ideologies, global communism pitched against the democratic West. Now we fast forward to 2023 and, okay, the identities have changed, but many of the challenges we face remain eerily familiar. Joining me to discuss Australia's dilemmas then and now is the Robert Menzies Institute Visiting Fellow, Dr. William Stoltz. Welcome to Afternoon Light again, Will. Georgina, it's it's a pleasure to be back for a second time. I must have done all right the first time to be welcome back. (laughs) Only very, very few yes have been back twice, so it's a special privilege afforded to you (laughs) and about two others. So thank you very much for taking the time. Now, in July last year, we held a dialogue with some leading foreign policy thinkers and historians about Australia's dilemmas then and now. Can you tell me what the premise of that dialogue was? Yeah, this was a quite, I suppose, unorthodox gathering. Those of us who kind of operate in the foreign affairs and national security space would be familiar with all sorts of different conferences of academics and practitioners that go on, but rarely is there a historian in the room. So this was a really great opportunity, I guess, to bring together a wider cast of experts, those people who really understand the strategic challenges we're facing today, alongside those people that understand the broader sweep of history and essentially the inertia of past events that's shaping our (laughs) present. And it was actually a bit experimental to see how this would go, to bring together a fairly diverse range of historians with a fairly wide range of experts about contemporary issues. And to be honest, I think it was a great success. It really drew out a range of fascinating insights. And I think what was really compelling about this was that it lifted people's perspective out of the here and now. Mm. It made them see, based on what policies the Menzies government and other governments had undertaken in the past, it made them see a wider range of what was possible Because I think for those people who are at the coalface of Australia's strategic decisions today, it's very easy to think that everything's novel, that everything's new, particularly because of themes like changing and emerging technology and just all the emergence of different threats that they perceive that, well, there is no precedent for this, this is entirely uncharted territory, and that the Australian government essentially has to kind of write it from a clean slate. The reality is is we can look back at previous governments and kind of get a sense of, if not direct lessons, at least insights about how we've behaved in the past. And it was a reminder as well, I think, that there are a lot of unending truths, unyielding truths about Australia's role in the world, about our geography, that don't actually change all that much, even though the characters and the technology and other things might change around us. Oh, absolutely. Well, I just think of Oppenheimer, which has become a smash sensation at the box office. And it's a movie about a really, really, really huge technological change in in warfare and in the end global energy too. That was happening just before this Mm. period we're discussing the Cold War and, of course, framed the Cold War. So don't think that AI and Mm. all the disruption that's happening around that is so novel when you think about all the disruption that happened around the birth of nuclear Mm. technology back in the 40s and 50s. History is okay, it may not be repeating, but it's rhyming, it's Mm. rhyming. (laughs) What I thought was interesting too, and we've talked about this in other conversations, Will, is this sort of idea of grand strategy. And that's where you do take that long view of history. And we are weak at this, I think, in Australia. And, of course, we're a middle power. We're not no. a great power. So so maybe we don't have the sort of mm. reflex to think in terms of grand strategy like the US and China would. But this conversation last year, and, of course, you've written this fantastic, really provocative and, I think, insightful report as an outcome of this dialogue that we're launching tonight with AsiaLink, That really draws on those sort of themes of the sort of grand strategic thinking and Mm. how you pitch all these ideas in a sort of historical progression and see how you affect the outcomes Mm. you want. Mm. Yeah, I think there's a certain school of thought that says that only great powers are capable of grand strategy because they are the only ones that have the, I guess, geographic and geopolitical space and the resources of national power. But I think that 
you can dispute that. I think you can look at past governments in Australia and perceive something of a grand strategy. Now, what do we mean by grand strategy? It is essentially the concert of a range of different levers of national power pushing towards the same goal. So you think about economic, defence, diplomatic, cultural and soft power pushing towards the same goal. And I think you can argue when you look at the Menzies government coming to power in the early Cold War in the late 1940s and early 1950s, that there is evidence of a grand strategy in the sense that Menzies was coming to power on the wave of an entirely new political party that had kind of said, look, the previous institutions of pre-war Australia weren't up to scratch anymore and we needed to wipe the slate clean and and look forward with a new party organised around a modern set of values, enduring but modern set of values, recast for the modern era. And you saw with Menzies and his cabinet a vision that encompassed remodelling and reorganising Australia's economy, uplifting Australia's military preparedness, overhauling our relations with our old friends, Britain, with new friends, United States, and even with our former adversaries, Japan. And you saw essentially a forward-leaning, proactive vision of what Australia wanted to achieve in its own region. Yes, Australia wasn't a great power and couldn't necessarily bring that vision about all on its own, but you saw a very clear sense from Menzies and his defence and foreign ministers in particular that they wanted an Asia-Pacific neighbourhood that was going to be safer for democracy, safer for economic liberalisation, for the world that they wanted Australia to live in. And I think you saw a consistency across the course of Menzies' time in office to pursue that grander goal. And I think you can argue that that is grand strategic in its sense, yeah. I also think what's important to reflect on about that period and, of course, now Mm -hmm. is the way things were framed in ideological terms. So Menzies saw everything through the lens of liberalism, Mm. democracy versus communism, socialism, and he would paint those divides and battle lines in a domestic context, of course, his Liberal Party versus the Socialist Labor Party, the people on the side of the individual versus the people on the side of sort of the communitarian communists. But then on a global stage, you, of course, had the ideological battle that he wanted to and was part of. And Menzies, not just as leader of Australia, but actually as an international statesman, would take a very strong leadership Mm. role in fighting the battle against global communism, which, of course, was spearheaded by the Soviet Union, but had, of course, Chinese Communist Party and others as it spread throughout Southeast Asia. So that framing is useful to think about. I mean, we're all familiar with the Cold War, but then how we sort of got out of the habit of ideological Mm. framing and Michael Wesley, who's Deputy Vice-Chancellor here at Melbourne University and very significant foreign policy thinker in his own right, he has reflected, and he did at the dialogue, on the fact that really in the Whitlam era there was sort of the de- Extraction of ideology. Extraction of ideology, Mm. yes, from our sort of international engagement. Same again in the 80s, although, of course, you know, it's sort of end of Cold War, but it was triumphalism of the West and we just sort of thought, oh, well, we've won and mm. we're now about making money and mm. trade and it was a really high point for international trade. But then in recent years we've been talking about the West again and Shinzo Abe, when he was Prime Minister of Japan, would talk about the diamond of democracies. Boris Johnson wanted a, was it a D10, a mm. grouping mm. of democracies, mm. the Quad is an extension of the trilateral strategic dialogue that came out of the Howard government that is a democracy grouping in this area. So all these sort of ideologically based groupings and that framing of us versus them, the communists or Mm. the authoritarians, is sort of back again, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is. And this is something I really try to draw attention to in this paper is that ideology matters. And I think Menzies understood this quite powerfully in that it can be sometimes an oversimplification to cast the world in a kind of binary liberalism versus authoritarianism. But the reality is what Menzies understood is that when you're trying to establish the moral justification of very difficult decisions that you're undertaking in the national interest, you need to be able to ground it in a larger ideological purpose. And you think about some of the things that occurred under his government. He went to war in Korea as part of a UN coalition. He went to war in Vietnam alongside the United States. But then there were, at home as well, difficult moral 
policies in the sense of attempts to constrain the Communist Party and freedom of speech and the establishment of intelligence agencies that arguably are doing things that are ethically challenging. And I think what he and his colleagues understood was that if you're going to go to the Australian people and say, we're going to expend all this blood and treasure overseas and we're going to do these things at home for the security of the nation, it has to be grounded in a larger moral ideological purpose. And I think you contrast that today. That's one of the things that's kind of missing from our discussion about what Australia is seeking to do in the world. I mean, you go and look at some of our guiding strategic documents over the last couple of years in Australia, and this phrase often comes up, which is talking about upholding the rules-based international order. Mm. Now, As a former Australian diplomat, uh, we could roll that off the tongue very easily. uh, But it is a phrase (laughs) essentially devoid of ideology in the sense that it's saying, yes, we want rules, but rules based on what? You may say that. (laughs) <laughs> well, it, it's but el- we, but we, <laughs> we in the no, no, it's full of ideology. Well, because it's the system we created, the liberal international order created, and we want to keep it that way. Exactly, but yeah. why don't we say more often <laughs> that we're seeking to preserve the liberals? rules-based order. Because that yeah. starts to exclude countries that aren't democracies and, mm. I, and that was going to be my next question mm. is mm. so we have this ideological framing and, look, I'm a huge supporter mm. of democracy promotion and, look, I was a neocon, mm. Mm. <laughs> probably still am a little bit of a neocon <laughs> even though it's very uncool and Neo, unfashionable. Yeah. So I support it but you go to Southeast Asia, a lot of the countries of ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, are not democracies, Mm. Vietnam, for example, or if they're democracies, they're very weak democracies, and you use our ideological framing and it doesn't resonate with its non-inclusive language. So if we want our – because we have to persuade, we can't use huge military force Mm. because we don't have it, let's be honest, and yes, we are an important trading partner to these countries, but we're not as Mm. important as China or the United States. So we have to use our statecraft, our persuasion, and we need to find ways to deliver messages that are also persuasive to those who don't necessarily share our instinctual attraction for democracy and values-based foreign policy. Mm. And I think this is the real challenge of being an era that we are in of great power competition where – the status quo of the rest of the 21st century is really going to be decided about which way those developing countries in the middle, which way they go. Do they seek, I mean, obviously most of them would prefer not to have to align with anyone because that's the ideal approach, but obviously the trajectory of the world isn't going that way. And so are they going to be pushed to align with the camp of authoritarian states, principally led by China, or are they going to be persuaded to align closer to the camp of liberal democracies at the moment, principally led by the United States? And I think in terms of when we look inward and try to justify some of the policies that Australia is taking at the international stage, we do need to be able to explain it in terms of ideology so that people understand what we're pushing for in the world. Because if we just fall into becoming a solely kind of transactional, pragmatic country that's just going to deal with anyone for our own kind of parochial interest, well, that doesn't necessarily create a better international system. And this gets to the other part of the ideological piece, which is actually getting our friends, our closest friends, to stand up for the values that matter as well. And I think, you know, we can turn to the discussion on the United States because this is a real challenge for Australia as well, is that we're potentially seeing in the US the re-emergence of some isolationist tendencies that are not necessarily going to create a world that's more safe for democracy, which is obviously what we as a middle power would like to see. So something that I find quite provocative in your paper is this suggestion that Australia should really lobby the United States to change some of its, I guess, governance arrangements or electoral arrangements in order to improve its democracy. And, I mean, look, having been Mm. someone who has been in and out of the United States and in and out of US politics and the bureaucracy, I've always been struck by how much we think about the United States and how little Mm. they think about us, Mm. as much as we think we are a staunch ally and we have bled together, fought together and believed in the same Mm. vision of the world for decades. They don't necessarily think 
that much about Australia on a daily basis. You know, oh, good, good. You know, mm. you're there. That's nice. But we don't have to worry about us. We turn around to them and say, look, you need to have compulsory voting. You had a nice list of things that I – you've stolen my report. Yeah, a de- so depoliticised judiciary, de-po- that was yes, another one. Yeah. I think we'd like um, to see that. So, I mean, mm. look, you know, fine. Yes, there are things that work for us, but why would America listen to us mm. and how would you deliver those messages in a way that would make them sit up and listen? Mm. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, I think this is a really good question. Look, we often hear from Australian prime ministers and indeed Australian historians as well talking about the proximity of Australia to the US being closer than anyone else, that we have this privileged relationship, this relationship of trust and influence. And I think if you look historically, you can point to instances in which Australia has really been able to shift the dial in terms of what America is doing outwardly in the world. One example that comes to mind is Harold Holt's relationship with LBJ during the Vietnam War. Now, some people might say that that relationship didn't necessarily lead to the positive outcome, but nevertheless, Harold Holt's, the resolve and support that he gave LBJ to continue the Vietnam War has been demonstrated to be key to LBJ continuing those policies. So I think you can look historically and see that Australia has had fairly important influence over what America does. And I think when it comes to how we as a middle power lead in the world, we lead by the power of example because we're not the biggest country in military power or in economic might, but we can lead through the example of how we govern ourselves. And we have to believe as Australians, I think, that we have probably the best democracy in the world. It's been tried and tested. We've learned from the mistakes of previous systems, including the United States, including Britain and others. And If we believe that, if we believe that our system is the best and that it is the most enduring and durable, then we should be advocating it to our friends at a time when they are experiencing some really quite loud and often violent tribalism that they need to address and that isn't being addressed and is arguably being accentuated because of structural frailties in that system that mean that people don't trust the outcome of elections, don't trust the decisions being made by their courts. That spells a really bad recipe for America's future. And we as Australia need America to be a strong democracy and we need America to be a powerful democracy in the world if it's going to use its power to make the international system safer for us and countries like us. So it's obviously a tall order for us to go to Washington and say this is how you should run your system. But if there's any country in the world that's got the proximity and the boldness and the pluckiness to (laughs) tell the Americans how to run their their own business, it probably is Australia. Well, and I think there are track two initiatives like the Australian American Mm. Leadership Dialogue where those conversations are much more easily Yeah. Yeah. And interparliamentary yes. diplomacy as well. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you do talk about that in your report, how mm. that is an opportunity for Australia. So the leader-to-leader diplomacy, which, you know, we've seen quite often in mm. our history. I mean, you just think of Howard and Bush, pairings like that have really made things happen. I mean, obviously mm. going into the Iraq war with the mm. Americans, but also we got the FTA with the US, which was incredibly important for our prosperity, mm. and I'm sure a bit for theirs too. But on US isolationism, which of course is a very much a 1930s concern, mm. Mm. and once again we have that as a concern, especially when Donald Trump was president and there's a possibility he might win election in the next year or so and we may very well face very much an isolationist US administration again and that has impacts, I mean, in the near term on Ukraine and potentially Taiwan too. In the Obama administration, of course, we had the pivot to Asia and everyone got Australian diplomats very excited about this. Finally, the US can stop worrying about the Middle East so much and be less sort of Atlantic focus and focus on Asia because we've been observing the Chinese military modernisation that's happening Mm. at rapid pace and the activities in the South China Sea, which actually, despite the pivot to Asia, happened during Mm. Obama's watch, really concerning. So hopefully this rhetoric will be matched by action. I would say very Mm. average report card on that. Mm. But I think there was hope with the Biden administration that there might be a reorienting back to Asia after the mm. rather hard to follow Trump years, especially with the China trade war. But the Ukraine 
conflict has made things once again focus on the Atlantic, on Europe. Who would have ever thought we'd have a big mm. war in Europe again? And as, again, I think Australia is really struggling to get the US's attention on our region at a time when we absolutely need it. Yeah, I think that's right. I think the Biden administration realised that how the war in Ukraine plays out is going to be really pivotal to how much freedom of action it has elsewhere in the world. I think it's clear that Joe Biden would really like to come to some sort of conclusion for the war in Ukraine before the next presidential election because he knows that all those middle America so-called families that had sons, brothers, fathers who died in or injured in Iraq or Afghanistan would have a very, very high sensitivity to the narrative around forever wars Mm, that certain people in the right would be putting out there. And they would look at increasing cost of living in their country, potential declining standard of living, and say, why on earth should we fight another one of these wars overseas in Europe? And so I think it's essential for, as I say, to the freedom of action of the Biden administration about what it does in the rest of the world to try and come to a resolution in Ukraine quickly and particularly when you do have those on the right of US politics who are in some cases expressing a complete disregard for the well-being of a European democracy, a Christian European democracy, which is a pretty astounding thing for people on the right of the US to take. But that speaks to, I think, the appeal of this isolationist strand. And so I think when you think about the commitments that Australia has made with the US in the form of AUKUS, getting America's focus back to our, this region is really going to be essential if those sorts of long-term initiatives are to get off the ground and if we're to actually put some credibility behind this strategy that's often referred to as the strategy of integrated deterrence, this idea that America, its friends and its allies around the world are going to create a kind of united front of joint activity that collectively deters China. Well, anyone who's worked in military or diplomatic circles knows that the key to effective deterrence is credibility. That deterrence isn't going to be credible if China isn't seeing proper commitments from the US into this region. So you have been involved in the sort of edges of the AUKUS discussions as you've been working at the National Security College at the ANU and been in and out of the Australian government as well. How serious is the United States, and I use that in the broadest term, not just say the State Department and the Pentagon, but how serious is the United States about AUKUS? And I'm thinking Congress, I'm thinking across party lines, because it's all very well for administrations to sign up to these things, but we are talking Mm. about a a multi-decade initiative and Look, over the weekend we had the ALP resolve some internal differences about its commitment to AUKUS and they seem to have been overcome, which is good, good for Australia. The hardheads prevailed over the sort of utopian peaceniks, which, okay, we'd love that world, but that's Mm. unfortunately not reality. Mm. So where have you seen the discussions in America leading us? Yeah, look, I think to ask for one answer of how things are perceived in the US, like that's the problem in the sense that there isn't a unified position. You know, we can certainly point to the current administration and a thankfully a significant portion, if not overwhelmingly significant portion of the current US Congress and say that they've come to a point of being supportive and committed to AUKUS. And that's after having to work out some issues around whether AUKUS would potentially undercut America's own submarine production line. Sure. You know, we obviously yeah. saw some some senators kind of raise those issues. And let's see if those issues are actually effectively put to bed. But this is the great challenge is that the AUKUS is essentially, like if we're being really detailed about it, like it, it is essentially a 100-year, if not more, endeavour. And so you cannot rule out that over the course of a century that there won't be significant divergence in one of the three participating governments. And so in that sense, to kind of bring it back to the discussion about how we influence and shape the United States, well, for this to be a success, we need America to be outward-facing, proactive nation in the world. We can't let them become inward and isolationist again because if they did, I think it would be logical to assume that a pact like AUKUS would be perceived as potentially not necessarily in their interests to continue when it comes to sharing their really most top secret sensitive information and technology with us. So, look, 
I think we need to go into it with our eyes open and realize that there are potential off ramps for all three of our governments over the course of that period to walk away from the deal. But that's not to say that we shouldn't keep pursuing it. I think the initial phase of it, particularly with the delivery of Virginia class submarines to Australia, we will see that. We'll see that soon. And that will be a real meaningful lift in Australia's military power. And that's going to be really quite excellent. The next phase of actually jointly building an entirely new submarine potentially in South Australia. (laughs) Look, that's another challenge entirely. But yeah, I think we can get there if we're persistent and keep our eyes open to the potential challenges that arise. I do want to ask you about America's economic policies Mm. and how they are leading it down the route to isolationism, I think, which is very concerning. But on industry policy Mm. as a Mm. (laughs) – well, on defence policy that is sometimes dressed up as industry policy, how do we get away from getting all the domestic politics and winning marginal seats, get all that away from these really, really important defence procurement decisions? Because, I mean, it's actually hugely – damaging to our fortunes, to our security, to prioritise building some submarines in some marginal seats Mm. over actually getting the ships in the sea Mm. and using them and them being a genuine deterrence. Mm. Well, look, I think there's an extent to which the dangerousness of our strategic environment will compel us to make more serious decisions. Yeah, I think in previous decades, and this is both sides of politics, There has been a willingness in Russell offices, particularly the ministerial suite, to see uh, defence policy as economic policy by proxy and Mm. to say, oh, okay, well, this project might be over budget and the timeframes are being blown out, but at least it's creating jobs. That doesn't fly anymore in an environment where, if we're being quite honest, we could be seeing conflict like war between two great powers, including Australia, within the next decade. That focuses the mind that we need to focus on essential sovereign capabilities. Mm. We need to be able to manufacture our own munitions. We need to be able to refine and store our own fuel. We need to be able to harden our own defence facilities so that we can support American power to be based in Australia. That focuses the mind and I hope will create more serious decision-making that removes some of those potentially second order benefits that people have often made the first order (laughs) benefit when it comes to defense planning. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. So at the moment, the Biden administration, when it comes to its sort of foreign policy positions is not presenting as isolationist. It's got a huge package through Congress to support Ukraine. It's saying the right things to the extent it can on Mm. on Taiwan. But in terms of its domestic economic policies, the Inflation Reduction Act, Mm. the CHIPS Act, these are about onshoring manufacturing, onshoring industry and setting America up for a sort of an autarkic world. Mm. And it can because it's got a population of 350 million, an enormous, geographically enormous country with varying resources spread throughout the country and, of course, climate spread throughout the country for Mm. agricultural production it could probably get by without the rest of us. Mm. That's kind of catastrophic for Australia. Mm. Mm. (laughs) I mean, you're talking about energy security issues and and onshoring of production of certain strategically important goods, but sort of framed in through a security Mm. lens. But the US policy is really to pump up its own economy, which is absolutely fair enough. Mm. But where does that leave the rest of the world? Because we are seeing, while Biden doesn't use the anti-globalisation tropes that Trump did, actually a lot of the policies are pretty similar. Yeah, I think this is a really excellent point. Because you're right, America does have the economic fundamentals to be a pretty self-sufficient, independent country. I mean, they've got the energy resources to be essentially energy independent, which is a pretty powerful thing for any economy to be able to achieve. I mean, so do we, mind you, if we (laughs) develop them accordingly. And I think this is where we need to get America, and not just America, but developing countries as well, to believe in trade again, Mm. to actually believe that if we are heading down a route where we're going to experience a slowing global economy, that the only way out of that is not to turn to protectionism, but is actually turned to a new era of shared mutual development through trade. And that's difficult at the moment because we are coming off decades of 
years and years and years of trade negotiations that have stripped the tree bare of any kind of low-hanging fruit. And barriers that remain to making our economies more complementary are very difficult. But this was something that was discussed at the dialogue and is mentioned in the paper by Jeff Wilson, who's head of economic research at Australian Industry Group. He advocates the idea of moving to a model of trusted trade where we seek new trading relationships where we put higher up the priority a kind of set of mutual values, where we actually start to focus on trading more with those nations that align with our national interests and our values in a wider way. What would Adam Smith and David Ricardo think of this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, it's not full-blown free trade, that's for sure. No, but yeah. I think in the hostile world that we are facing, it's probably a good way to go. It's to say, well, we can't entirely globalize our critical supply chains. There are things, strategically important things, that we're going to have to have more control over, onshoring them potentially in some instances, but that where we can, we should try and, and avoid onshoring them and try and friendshore them or engage in trusted trade where we use the comparative advantages of our friends, our countries that align with our values, to still be able to produce goods in a way that's still cost-effective and contributing to a growing global economy. So when I'm listening to you talk about this concept, it makes me think that Xi Jinping thought of this before us Mm, mm. and he had his One Belt, One Road Mm. initiative where he was lining up all his friends Mm. around the world or China was lining up Mm. all their friends around the world through huge investments in infrastructure across Asia and Africa and, and Europe and through very favourable debt arrangements that sometimes went awry for countries like Sri Lanka. So how do we compete? Are we too late? Has China already locked in its friends in a sort of global trade network of its own trusted trade? Mm. And where does that leave the West, for want of a better Mm. expression? Mm. Yeah, I think the key word in this discussion is trust in the sense that I don't think that many of China's partners under One Belt, One Road or other arrangements really trust China to actually be a reasonable But do they trust the United States? Well, potentially not, but if you have- Because mm, we instinctively go, well, the United States is more trustworthy than China mm, as Australians, as a liberal democracy. But if you're sitting in Africa or even Southeast Asia, Mm, US mm. versus China, well, there may be- two sides of the same coin? Well, I think if you look at the record of China versus the United States and include other free market economies, look at their record at all the international arbitration bodies when it comes to intellectual property and trade disagreements, which countries are the ones that actually follow the rules and which ones are the ones that don't. And you can clearly see that China flaunts all sorts of international agreements when it comes to trade and and other institutions. So that's an indicator. You're right. But yeah, this is the contest that we face is to show to developing countries that partnerships with liberal-minded states is ultimately going to benefit their economy and their wider society more so than what China is putting on the table. So Obama, of course, had the Trans-Pacific Partnership Mm. Agreement, which Mm. was kind of supposed to be a grouping of like democratic yeah. countries, yeah. or at least, yes, like-minded countries that would create this very significant trade block. And, of course, in the 2016 presidential election, both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton mm. moved away from commitment to TPP and inevitably Donald Trump did walk away from the TPP once he was elected president. It was resuscitated and mm. now is the CPTPP. I mean, these tradies really need to work on their acronyms. Oh, my God, it's terrible branding, terrible, isn't it? Terrible, yeah. terrible. Anyway, another UK wants to join. Mm. No sign at all that the US will reconsider joining, which is a huge shame. And, of course, now China would like to join and China mm. has ASEP as well, mm. which is the, I think, Regional Comprehensive yeah. Economic yeah. Partnership. So yeah. trusted trade, okay, agree with it or not, but let's say we do agree with it. 
you create a grouping like CPTPP? Is mm. that how it would be structured? And how does a country qualify? Does that mean then if you are part of this grouping that you cannot trade with China at all? I mean, mm. are we going to find we're in this sort of completely, absolutely is Cold War again where you, you can't go to mm. China, mm. you can't mm. go to Cambodia, the client states of China then become just sort of don't touch zones because they're in their orbit and trade is only with that group. Mm. Is that a world we want to live in? Well, I think when you look at some of the behaviour of the United States, we're certainly seeing the emergence of, they don't call it this, but decoupling. You look at what the United States is doing in in relation to semiconductors and Mm. all sorts of essential electronic components. They are stripping out any vulnerabilities that touch the Chinese economy. And that's all well and good for the United States because the United States has got the intellectual property and the know-how when it comes to the manufacturing of these critical but highly complicated pieces of technology for Australia and other countries, is that necessarily going to lead to a better outcome? We rely on, in a digitised economy, we rely on easy and cheap access to a range of complex electronics that potentially are going to become exorbitantly more expensive and harder to get if we went down a route of complete decoupling of the US and Chinese economic systems. So this is where I think we need to focus on our national interests as not always necessarily being entirely in lockstep with the United States, that there are going to be areas in which Australia will favour a more globalised economic system than the United States, and we're potentially going to have to put that argument together. And maybe sometimes we aren't necessarily going to win that argument, but that's when you have the opportunity to be able to work with other smaller countries to be able to find potentially different sources of critical components and these sorts of things. But this is the real challenge for a free trading open country like Australia is that the global settings are heading towards a world that is much more closed economically, diplomatically, in all sorts of senses. And we have to try, (laughs) as we might, to open it back up. Yes, and our openness is one of our key vulnerabilities. Mm. So, yeah, we have to deal with it. The how is, of course, the the topic of debate. I thought I'd finish our discussion today, Will, by discussing our near region, where Australia is a regional leader, and that's, of course, the South Pacific. Now, something you propose in your paper, which has been you know, an idea that's been around the traps mm. a bit, but I think is quite exciting, is this idea of a Pacific Union. And, I mean, I did when I was reading, I thought, oh, God, is this sort of like a European Union? And, you know, I was a massive Brexiteer, so <laughs> certainly not up for that. But, look, I think in terms of a, a common market, a free movement of trade, obviously, but people – There is something compelling Mm. about deepening our relationship with South Pacific neighbours, but it does beg the question, while those sort of micro-states, I think most Australians would have quite a bit of sympathy facing Mm. uh, rising sea levels and inundation of low-lying islands and potentially need new homes. There are also great benefits for Australian regional communities in terms of Pacific labour migration and seasonal workers. These microstates would benefit from remittances Mm. back home that you could get from Australia. But when it comes to the larger Pacific neighbours like Papua New Guinea, which has a, I mean, not sure of the exact population, Mm. it could Mm. be between 9 and 17 million people Mm. depending on where Mm. you get your numbers from, and endemic problems Mm. around criminal gangs and corruption. How do we bring together this idea of some sort of Pacific Union Mm. and At the same time, we need to appreciate the strategic context here where China is offering something Mm. quite tantalising. It hasn't been accepted by the Mm. Pacific Islands Forum of a sort of comprehensive economic and security partnership. They've said no, but they might say yes Mm. in the future. Mm. So actually we kind of need to get on with this idea if we're serious about it. Yeah, I think that's right. I absolutely do. And look, this isn't my original idea. This has circulated for a while. The Howard government briefly explored the idea of a Pacific Union and I think it also popped up under the Rudd government as well. And I'd like to think that there would be sympathetic ears to it on both sides of politics today because, as you point out, there's a degree of urgency where the Pacific Island Forum and individual states in the region are telling us that they want a regional approach. And the reality is, is when you look at some of the development obstacles, the development challenges that face the the South Pacific, they're really going to be only solved with a regional approach. When you think about, for example, 
the challenges around digital infrastructure, telecommunications infrastructure. Well, you can't make a lot of this infrastructure commercially viable if you're only doing it on a state-by-state basis. But Mm. if you approach it regionally, you can find ways to make it work. And I think that's the case for a range of essential pieces of infrastructure and services that are actually key to the economic growth and and the human well-being of these countries. And yes, I take your point absolutely that this would be a very difficult task and would be a grand strategic one that would have to take a while to implement. But I think it's worth reflecting on the approach that we've taken to this date and to draw it back to the historical kind of comparison. I think there's a lot of historical baggage that weighs on Australia's approach to the South Pacific, which has resulted in something of a bipolar approach in the sense that we feel awkward and uncomfortable about our colonial past. It's worth remembering that a number of these states were territories of Australia up until fairly recently, and we feel a little bit awkward about that. And there's a sense from Australian officials that we want to be undertaking measures that maximise the freedom of choice and sovereignty of every Pacific state. But then on the other hand, we have to accept that we are inextricably linked with these nations. These nations are key to our territorial security and that we have to continually make pretty big commitments to uphold these as functioning societies. Australia, I don't know if how many people know this, we underwrite the budget of the PNG government, meaning we give them money to run that country essentially, which is a pretty extraordinary thing. And you think, well, my argument is, is that the approach to date of support to these countries but then – not necessarily enough to make them flourishing, has kind of held them in a degree of suspended animation where neither are they completely toppling over but neither are they necessarily on a road to being sustainable as entirely independent and democratic states and economies. And that's why I think an approach like a Pacific Union where we tackle these problems as a collective of states where possible do away with certain barriers to migration and try and maximise the kind of pooled sovereignty of these countries is probably an approach worth trying if we're to make these countries sustainable, well-developed and independent nations. And look, the Menzies government had form with some structures, like, for example, the Colombo program, Mm. which, you know, obviously had a student, international student education angle, but it was broader than that and it was about really giving development assistance to Mm. a whole range of Asian nations that were in Australia's region and we wanted to see rise up and develop. We also had the Southeast Asian Treaty Organisation, which Mm. is an oft-forgotten piece of regional architecture that sort of went into abeyance really sort of I think by the 1970s. Mm. But that was supposed to be another NATO. Mm. It never did get off the ground in such a structure, but there was form Mm. and, I mean, it needs the political will and there's, of course, concerns about ceding sovereignty on the part of Pacific Island nations to Australia, sort of former colonial power. I think those things can be managed because I don't think Australia would seek Mm. to have some sort of pooled sovereignty approach like the EU. Mm. I think there would be more attraction around trade and movement of people and actually that's Mm. I think there'd be huge mutual benefits Mm. if it could be structured effectively and appropriately and and managing all the risks that we would see of some of the problems in importing problems from some of the Pacific Island countries. Will Stoltz thank you so much for your time this is a fantastic effort this report and we will have this online for anyone to download I think it's a must read it offers a whole lot of challenging provocations to the foreign policy community. It's grounded in history, which we always like, particularly Menzies history, and it's well thought out, and I thoroughly recommend it to you all, listeners of Afternoon Light. Thank you so much for all your efforts, Will. Thank you, Georgina, and thank you to the team here at Robert Menzies Institute for making the paper possible. That's it for this week's episode of Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute. Please make sure to subscribe and catch up on our latest online content on our website or on Twitter, LinkedIn or Facebook.